All right, so we, we are in a discussion about coming out of the shallows. Uh, the whole idea of this series is that uh, the deep is calling. It's always calling when you're a kid and you're swimming in a pool. You know, you start off from the shallow end, but, but you can't wait to get to the deep end, right? Deep, deep is calling us. I want to get there. That's where the excitement is. I can dive. I can jump. I can do cannonballs and get everybody else wet. That's, that's where the fun of life is. And very much as that happens in, in our lives kind of physically as we mature and we develop, it also happens spiritually. That there is more to faith than just encountering Jesus. There's more to faith than coming and sitting in rows, that there's more to faith than, than where we start, that the same progression we take physically also should happen for us spiritually, that we should be going deeper in our faith, that we should be learning more about our, our, our creator, about our savior, about Jesus, and our faith should be developing. But the, the challenge for many of us is that some of us never get out of the shallow end, that it could be years and it could be decades, and, and if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in the very same place we started with no more depth to our faith, with no more growth. And that's what this whole series is about, that no matter where we find ourselves in the spectrum, whether you're the hungry novice, you're the person who's kind of new to faith, and you're just wanting more of God and more of what God has for you, uh, that this series is for you. Maybe, maybe you don't find yourself being the hungry novice. Maybe you find yourself being the, the restless veteran, the, the guy who's been in church for years and years and years, and you've kind of, you, you, you've worked through faith, and, and, and maybe you, you find yourself maybe taking a step back, maybe kind of hitting pause on your faith and maybe hitting some kind of stagnation, then this series is for you. Maybe you're the curious skeptic, the person who's really not sure about Jesus, not sure about God, and you got a lot of questions and you want to know, is, is there something real to this? Is there something powerful to this whole Jesus thing? This story is for you. And the hope is that all of us would, would take steps in our faith and get a little deeper, to grow a little deeper. Believe it or not, that's why we named the church Journey, is that we believe faith is, is, is a journey. It, it's, not, it's not a destination. It's something we continue to grow in. And no matter where we find ourselves, we should be taking steps further and further. Even if you find yourself happy where you are. I'm happy. I, you know, I, I just kind of came to this whole faith thing. I, I love God and I'm content where I am. My hope is that, that over the last few weeks and even in, in the, uh, this week and the week to come, that, that maybe there's this healthy dissatisfaction that maybe there is more to this thing, and maybe I should want to see what that more has for us. Week one, we start off really with this whole thing is about four principles of how we can, we can grow deeper, of how we can come out of the shallows and into this deeper side of faith. Four dials, if you were, four roles we need to kind of step into. Week one, we talked about that, and the first one is that we, we needed to learn how to feed ourselves, that, that this isn't just like a somebody else kind of thing. When we think of this idea of growing deeper or maybe growing in our faith, Maybe our, our initial thoughts are, but isn't that the church's job? Like, isn't, Jim, isn't, isn't that your job? And what we discovered is, no, we all have a part to play. That, that, that God is constantly working. God's constantly wanting to move us, and he's, he's constantly wanting to draw us into, into a deeper relationship. But that if, if we don't get out of the way, we're really standing in the way, and we're kind of stopping or, or, or uh, pausing God from moving. That we need to get out of the way and begin to work with God. That it's really not up to somebody else. It's up to us. We need to learn how to feed ourselves. And then we invited you to this really cool experiment called 21 Days of Deeper. Right? 21 Days of Deeper is essentially you, you sign up for this and every morning you get a text message with a passage of scripture and a, a formula for kind of working through your faith and working through what you're reading. Many of you have already done that and I wanna, I'm so proud of you. I want to encourage you to keep doing it. Some of you haven't done it yet and you're debating whether or not to jump on board. Jump on board. You can do it today. All you have to do is text 21, write it out, 21 to 97000. And every morning you'll get a text message that has a scripture verse that connects to a formula for how to work through whatever it is you're reading. We've had a lot of people doing it, and we're hoping a lot more catch up. If you feel like you've missed a few weeks and you want to go back, head out to our website, and you can see everything that we've been doing so far through 21 Days of Deep. But that, that, was, <clears throat> that was kind of the first principle, the first dial, if you will, that we need to learn to feed ourselves, and this is how we do it. The, the second principle is, is, is this, and this is what we talked about last week, that for most of us, it's, we kind of go through faith sitting on a couch, Right? And that if we want to get deeper in our faith, we've got to get off the couch and we've got to begin working out. We've got to work out what God is already beginning to work inside of us. That it's not good enough to just sit and consume and consume and consume. Eventually, you've got to spend some of the calories you're consuming. And you've got to get, begin working out. Maybe, maybe in your family's lives, maybe in your friends, maybe in your community or your workplace. That faith to grow deeper can't just be sitting. It needs to be moving. It needs to be part of action. That was last week. That was principle number two. This week... We're going to dive right into principle number three. <clears throat> and where I want to go this week is, is I kind of want to talk about, um, in, in regards to faith, is that there are certain things in life that, that we have this idea that, that we can just do it alone. 
Um, there, there are certain areas of our life, if you will, that we kind of feel like, you know, I, I'm good. I, I got this on my own. And, and one of the areas that I think, um, for, for example, that we, we kind of think of as an area that we got this on our own, in particular, comes with, with ladders. That, that some people think, you know, I, I can do this thing on my own. I can set up a ladder on my own. I can climb up a ladder on my own. But as we're going to see with this guy here, this isn't always the case. You know, he thinks, I got this. I'm good. I'm going to set a ladder up on a table. Uh, on a table, <laughs> mind you. <clears throat> I got this. And then this, this happens. <clears throat> Maybe ladders are on the list of things that we shouldn't be doing alone. But we do. We think, oh, I'm good. I got this. I, I'm going to do this alone. Here's something else that, that maybe we shouldn't be doing alone. Uh, this is, um, <clears throat> the video is going to keep playing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to keep playing until I stop. So we're, can we go back to the other slide just for the sake that I can capture everyone's attention one more time? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I do have another video for you, though. You'll like this one. Ladders aren't the only thing we think we can do alone. Here's another thing we think we can do alone. It's moving, right? We're going to show you another video. This guy thinks it's a great idea to move a TV. I'm going to wrap it up in a tarp, tie it to a rope, and I'm going to lower it. I got it. Look up. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. And then I love this. Listen to what this lady says she's recording. This is, yeah, like, thanks. All right? Thanks. Thanks so much. Like, it wasn't good enough that the TV broke the truck of my car off. We're going to jump back again. We're, we're going to pause this next service. Here's one more. And I love this one may, may be my favorite. Uh, you guys ever go to the gym and you work out and someone says, hey, you need a spot? Like, no, bro, I got this. I'm good. I'm really good. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's me. I, I've done that before. And, and uh, so has this guy. And I, I thought this was, this was great. Sometimes you think you can do anything on your own in particular. This guy, he's, he's the guy. He, he's it. He's got it. <clears throat> Come on, we've all been there, right? I love this. Just when you think he still has his man card. Listen to this. <laughs> right? M mothers, you've been with us through our worst times and our lowest times of life. <clears throat> there are things we think <laughs> we can do alone that we shouldn't be doing alone. A and the truth is, Faith is one of those categories. Uh, maybe a, a lot of us, we, we've kind of worked through faith, and, and faith is one of those things we were just kind of told to do alone, right? It, you don't talk about faith. It's like, you know, you, you, you come to your family gathering, and it's, it's faith and politics, right? We don't talk about those things. You do that kind of thing on your own. But what, what I want to present to you this morning is, is that I don't think that's the case at all, that, that I think faith is one of the things that we were meant to do together. But, but what ends up happening is that many of us try to do this faith thing alone, and we never get where God intended us to go. That we never experience the depths that God wants for us and that God is hoping we get to because we walk the road alone. Because faith is one of those things that we do by ourselves. And, and what I'm presenting to you is that I think what we really need to do if we want to go deeper in our faith is not walk the road alone, but, but find some friends. Really, this is kind of the, the bottom line for the message this morning is that your faith needs friends. You need to have friends in, in your faith, and, and if you don't, you're never going to experience the level of faith and the level of depth that you could if you walked through it together with other people. And I know, I know that's uncomfortable for us, because, because some of you, really, there, there's two sides of, of, or maybe two decisions that kind of weigh in here for reasons you wouldn't want to do this. I understand where you're going, because I'm one of those people, right? It's a personality thing. I, I'm, I'm introverted. Believe it or not, I'm introverted. I don't like talking to a lot of people. I know, I, I picked like the worst career in the world, right? <laughs> <clears throat> but, but it's my personality. I, I'd rather be alone. I, I, don't, I don't need other people. And, and I, I don't like to open up. I'm shy. And, and, and I'm uncomfortable doing that. I understand that a personality, it might be an issue. Uh, another side of it might be tradition, that you grew up in, in a faith tradition where, where faith was meant for you to carry it out alone. And, and it kind of stood in the way, actually, of you growing deeper with God because you weren't meant to do faith alone. And, and, and here's something that, that I had a most that I think is, um, just a, a brilliant statement. I don't think it's necessarily me. I, I believe it's probably God. But any tradition that gets in the way of what God wants for you is a bad tradition. If God is trying to get you to go deeper and your faith tradition says faith is all up to you and you shouldn't do it with other people, then that's a bad tradition because that will get in the way of what God ultimately wants for you. He wants you to experience the depths. He wants you to go deeper. Deep is calling because God is calling. And he has more in this life for you than you've ever experienced and that most of you can ever imagine. 
But if you try to do this faith thing alone, you'll never get there. So th- this morning, that's really what I want to invite you to. I want to invite you to put some friends to your faith. I, I want you to reconsider maybe so th- th- these two really hard things for us to get by, especially for, for men. Men seem to be m- more closed off, and we don't like to talk, and you know, things get emotional and relational, and I'd rather just, just sit by myself and watch football. I- I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to challenge you to reconsider that. That maybe what God is looking for you to do is to put some friends around your faith and start walking through life together. Because truly, we are better together. And your faith will experience things that you never, ever thought possible. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture. This is why I think this and why I think you should, should do this. We're going to look at the passage of Scripture found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is in the New Testament. Uh, we talked about this in week one, that we're not really sure who the author is. Some people think it's Paul. Some people think it, it, it may be a, a number of other theologians Uh, Some might even think that that a lady may have written the book. We're not really sure. But what we do know is this, is that the author is talking to a group of people that he deeply cares about. And he's deeply concerned about where their faith is and where their faith should be going. And he writes to them this incredible passage of scripture that we're going to read through together. This is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, people that, that I really do care about, that I really do love, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus. And I know if you're new here, if you're new to faith, this sounds really cryptic and really kind, kind of weird. But there's an explanation for this, and, and I'll jump into that in, in a minute. <clears throat> into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have the great priest over the house of God. Now, this is all, all kind of a reference to what happened in, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was God kind of resided in, in, a, in a building, in a temple, and there was the most holy place where God was. And, and normal people, average people, couldn't go in. And, and what the author is saying here is, is that God has more for you because of what Jesus did, because he kind of sacrificed his life for you, that you can now enter into the most holy place, that the veil that stood between you and God has been ripped through his sacrifice. And, and now it's opened up for you to come into and to be in a relationship and to commune with God. The author is saying this, is that there is more to this thing with God than you ever imagined, and it's available to us through what Jesus offered. And this word since is a really key word here because we're in, in chapter 5 of Hebrews, and he's, or sorry, chapter 10. He's saying that for the, nine, the past nine chapters, everything I wrote about God and God's goodness and God's greatness and God's plans for your life, all of the, that amazing thing is leading to this point. Since everything I said before and all of the goodness of God, here's now what I want you to do with it. And he's going to lead into the application. He's going to lead us into the action. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it, but I'm not going to put uh, the scriptures on screen right away. I'm going to read it to you from my Bible. And I want you to pay attention because there's a phrase that the author uses over again several times throughout this that I think is the key not only to this passage, but the key to this message and the key to our faith going deeper. And, and really, it's the key to why I'm up here. So if I'm not right, then I should, we should all just go home. <clears throat> this is found in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to ge- begin reading at verse 2. He says this. Now, I want you to re- listen for the phrase that he uses several times. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with <clears throat> the full assistance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience of having your bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us continue, or sorry, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Did you guys hear that phrase he used? Somebody shout it out if you heard it. Let us. Let us. Several times. Let us. Let us. This isn't, this isn't a me thing. This isn't let me. This isn't let you. This is let us. Let us do these things. So I'm going to read it one more time. And any time we get to to that phrase, let us, I want you to say it with me. You ready? Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. The author, the author is very clear here. Let us. Let us move forward in our faith. Let us consider how our faith should grow. Let us work together. Let, let us partner together in this because you alone will not experience all that God wants for you. You alone, if you walk through faith, you may get to the end and, and you, may, you may have survived. Your faith may have survived but it may be weaker and it may be battered and it may be torn. 
See, you, you can do it alone, but you'll never experience all that God has for you. You, you can make it alone, but you'll never experience the depths of all that God wants you to experience. And the author's saying, guys, I, I want you to grow. I want you to grow in your relationship with God, but, but you got to stop doing it alone. Let us. So here, here's what I want to do. There's four things I found through this passage in regards to, to, to let us, to us doing faith together. Four things that you can experience going through faith together that you will not experience if you try to do faith alone. Four things for us to consider. And, and the first one, we're, we're going to read this. It's, it's <clears throat> right out here. Let us. Let us draw near to God together. Let us draw near to God together. That, that there, there is something in, in, in this whole idea of us doing faith as opposed to me doing faith. Let us draw near to God together. Can you go back to, to the, the, the verse for this? <clears throat> Let us draw near to God with a full and a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Let, let, let us draw near to God with, with, with a heart that's open, with, with, with the assurance that, that God is there and God is for us. You, you weren't meant to do this alone, but sometimes it's what we do. We walk through alone and, and, and life kind of beats us down a little bit and, and we, we begin to question our, our, our faith a little bit. And he's saying, no, if you do it together, there's, there's an assurance that faith brings. It's like when you get around somebody whose faith is on fire and it's just, it, it, it's amazing to be around them. Your faith kind of ignites a little bit and you get more excited. It's like that time you heard a worship song and you're, you know, you see it in the car alone and you're like, oh, this is so nice. And then you come to church and Cheryl sings it and everybody else starts singing and it's like, wow, that song came alive in a way I never thought possible. It's like that time you read a scripture verse on your own and it's like, yeah, that's interesting. And then you read it in your small group and people talk about what it has done for them and how it's changed their life. And it's like, no, no, now that that scripture has life and it has value and it has meaning that it never took on before because you're doing it together. Let us draw near to God together. You see, the truth is, you will never get as close to God alone as you could if you're doing it with a group of people, with other people, with friends in your life. So what I've done is, is you know, you've heard me talk about this, that we are a church of small groups, that we, we are sold out to doing small groups. So I basically reached out to our small groups, and I asked, I asked them to write some stories to share their experiences with group. And so I want you to know this is a real story from real people in this real church meeting in real living rooms every single week. Here's a story that talks basically about this, about how we draw near to God together. I love this story. <clears throat> I'm not going to give the names away. <clears throat> but here's what this guy says. He says, we all may be uniquely different from one another, but we all share one major thing in common. The relationships formed over the last year have allowed me to share my darkest secret a secret that controlled me for many years. I always thought it would destroy me, but it ended up freeing my soul. Then I decided to surrender and to follow Jesus and be reborn through Christ. That day I left my insecurities underwater. This is the day he was baptized. And I now wholeheartedly trust my creator. My faith has been harshly tested this year, but I have never, ever been happier. And I have never, ever felt stronger. This is a real person sitting in a real group Drawing near to God together. And his life has never been the same. And here's the thing. That's exactly what God wants for you. God wants you to experience that kind of relationship, that kind of closeness, where we as people surround each other, where we as people draw each other nearer to God and encourage each other to find more of God, where things that maybe stood in the way before aren't things that would keep us from experiencing what God has for us. They're simply just little roadblocks that you can get by and you can get around that we can overcome if we do it together. And that's what he wants for you. See, I, I know that because that, I experienced that in my own life. I experienced, there are times in my life where, where I know I'm a professional Christian, but, but, but I just, I need to be encouraged and I need people to come around me and say, we can do this thing together. We can draw near to God together. This isn't insurmountable. If you do it alone, you're never going to get there. That was, that, that was just the first principle, draw near to God together. The author of Hebrew goes on, he says this, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And what he's referring to here is this, this kind of Old Testament uh, idea, this, this Old Covenant idea that I, I really want to explain to you because I think it, it, it's so incredible. In, in the Old Covenant, back in the days of Judaism, they, they believed that when you did something wrong, you came and you washed your body and you offered a sacrifice and the priest would, would sacrifice the animal and then he would literally sprinkle you with blood. And that that sprinkling of blood 
what would somehow cleanse you from your sin for a time. It would overcome your sin. It was kind of an answer to the sin problem for a time. But, but that, that sprinkling of blood had to be done over and over and over again, every time you made a mistake. And he's saying, you see, this, this idea of, of us being, being cleansed from our sins, in, in days past, it was just a sprinkling of, of, of an animal's blood. And then Jesus comes along and Jesus says, I love you so much. I'll be that sacrifice. I'll offer myself for you. I'll be that. And Jesus' blood was shed and his blood was sprinkled on us and it forever defeated sin. You see, here's something that we can do together that we could never do alone. And that's defeat sin. You can overcome sin in your life together better than you ever can alone. I I know you guys think I'm a professional Christian, but there are are days I have bad days. There are times where I have bad weeks. There there are times where where I feel like like life is beating me down. And not like like because other things are happening like bad to me. It's because I've been doing bad things. I haven't been doing the things I should. I've, I've been underperforming in areas that I should be more concerned about. And it is so incredibly helpful to have people come alongside me and remind me, hey, hey, Jim, like, you've been forgiven. I don't know if you know that, man, but, but, but you've been forgiven. You're not, like, the guilt and the shame, it's gone. You don't need to live under that anymore. And as much as I, I preach and I profess that to you, sometimes it's helpful for me to be reminded that, yes, you've made mistakes. Yes, you're not going to be perfect. But, dude, you don't have to be. That's why we have Jesus. Another thing that that I'm reminded of that I think is absolutely awesome, and this is what people believed about Jesus, is that the sacrifice that Jesus offered for you, it doesn't just offer forgiveness, but it offers freedom. That you're no longer bound to that thing, that the thing that you did, no, you no longer have to identify with that. You no longer are that. Just because you did it, just because it happened to you, that is not you. You have been set free. Jesus talks about it being a new creation. Paul says you're like a new creation. You've been created brand new. What was old has passed away. Just as as that guy talked about in his testimony, that I've come out of the water and I'm a new person. That's exactly what it's like. You've been born again into something brand new. What you were is not who you are. You are something new because of Jesus. And sometimes I need to be reminded, Jim, you're free. You're not who you were. You're not what that mistake was. You're not what that thing that you struggle with is not you. The thing is, I can't do that alone. Neither can you. We were never meant to do that alone. I I have another story. This guy says this. As I built relationships in the group, the accountability has grown, and it made me realize that sinful things that we do are not worth the risk of letting your friends down, or worse, hurting the relationships that you value the most. As I see others in the group growing in their relationship with God and overcoming their issues... It inspires me to continue to grow and to change and to experience the freedom that only Jesus can provide. You see, you can't do it alone. And for some of you, you've been battling and you've been struggling. and You're like, no, I've, I've just got to keep this thing secret. I've got to keep it quiet. Eventually, I'll get it. And I think God's saying, no, you're never supposed to do it that way. Surround yourself with some people who can encourage you and together you can defeat the sin that holds you. It's just part three. Go part two. He goes on for the third one. He says this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. Let us hold on to the hope unswervingly. See, the, the, the thing that we can do together that we can't do alone is hold on to hope. You see, you, you can have so much faith and, and so, much, so much hope for you and for your future, so much hope for your career and for your children, so much hope for your family, so much hope for your church. You can just, you can just be full of hope. And then you know what happens? Life throws a curveball. And here's the thing. It's not if it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen because it always throws the curveball. And, and immediately it hits us. And, and what's the first reaction is, is we, we're tempted to kind of swerve in our faith. We're tempted to kind of doubt and, and, and maybe disbelieve or unbelieve the, something that God promised. You see, life always throws the curveball. Things are always going to happen. No matter how much hope we have for our future, something might happen and our career gets a little shaky and, and this relationship that we've, we've had for decades begins to fall apart and someone we, we deeply love gets sick and then we, we have a, a, a problem rebellious child or, or maybe a child that has to go to a hospital. An, an accident happens and our faith is shaken. But the author is saying You're never meant to do those things alone. 
And in the moments when you're shaken, if you've surrounded your faith with friends, they're there to pick you up and encourage you and push you forward. For some of you, this is where you find yourself. Questioning, I was there. Is God really good? Look what's happening. Look at my life. Look at my experiences. And the author's saying, if you're going through faith alone, that's how you're going to feel. But if you surround your faith with some friends, the darkest times in life, the challenging, the most challenging times of life that come can be overcome because of the friends you have. I'll, I'll quote it from Jesus. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome the world. And if you've surrounded your faith with friends, the moment you need to hold on to hope, they'll be there to encourage you to hold on and not let go. Here's another story. I love this. This was written by a pair of sisters. Over the course of about 11 months, our family lost four people, two aunts, an uncle, and our step-grandfather. Prior to joining our group, we felt that we had to grieve and process through our losses on our own and with our family. But after joining our group, we were able to have a second family, a family to help us through the process. We were able to pray together and seek strength together and peace through the Lord that we were not necessarily open or drawn to before. We've been able to draw nearer to God through our small group. And in these tough times, because we have been able to discuss and process our feelings with people who are walking with us, we now have the opportunity to open up and be vulnerable with a support system that we've never had before. And we couldn't be more thankful. For some of you, that's exactly what you need. But the more you try to do this thing alone, you'll never experience it. And when life throws a curveball, you're going to be the one sitting back questioning. And who's going to be there to help? Who's going to be there to surround you, to encourage you, to lift you up, to remind you that he who has promised all of this is faithful to the end? That's three. He goes on to part four. He says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The final thing that we can do together, that we can do better together than we would ever do alone is this, change the world. What, what can one person do about the poverty in Bangor? Nah, not much. But what could all of us do if we work together? What could one person do to make a difference in, the, in our school systems and our community? Oh, not a whole lot. But what if we all rallied around a school and said, we are going to make sure this is the best place for our children forever? You see, when we do things together, changing the world seems a little more feasible. And isn't that what Jesus told us to do? To take my message, to take my love and go and change the world? Here's the final story. One of my favorite memories from small group is when we, were, we served Hamden together at Children's Day. When I arrived at the location to serve, I was told what to do and where and who I'd be serving with. Working alongside other group members spawned amazing conversations while we happily served other people. Not only did we discover that we had much in common about each other, we formed an amazing friendship, but we got to serve others while doing it. Now, together, we get together on a regular basis and we continue to lift each other up to this day. Friendships were formed around serving others and changing the world. Friendships that not only lasted a day, but now have lasted a lifetime and continue to spur each other on to love and to good deeds. You see, the, the truth is this, is your faith might be great where it's at on your own, but it would be amazing if you put some friends around it. The bottom line for today's message is this, and I could go on, for hours about how much better it is to be doing faith with people than without. But the author of Hebrews stopped here. So <clears throat> for your sake, we'll stop here. He, he says this, and this is, this is really what I feel is kind of the bottom line for today, is that we is always greater than me. Anytime you have an opportunity to do something with people, to experience faith with people, to experience the words of Jesus with people, is better than doing it alone. The truth is, a deep faith is a faith that has friends. A deep faith is one that has friends that will surround each other, that would encourage each other to, 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 to pursue God, to grow in your depths of God, to overcome sin, to hold on to hope, and to change the world. 
But you won't experience that faith if you're doing it alone. So here's my question to you, and I think it's just a really simple question. Do you have people like this? Do you have people like this in your lives? And to be honest, I'm always amazed when I ask this question to people, how many people respond to me? How many friends, how many acquaintances respond to me? No, I, I really don't. I think that's something we need to fix. The author concludes the passage this way. <clears throat> he says, let, let us, after all of this, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And, and the day he's talking about is the day where Jesus would, would come back, where Jesus would return and kind of put an end to the chaos in the world. So, so what he's saying is the closer we get to that day, as, as time continues to move on, we need to be doing this more and more and more and more. And when you think you haven't talked to your friends enough, you need to go and you talk to them some more. And when you think you've met with people enough, you need to go and you need to meet some more. Because as the day approaches, we need to be encouraging each other more and more and more. We need to be serving each other more and more and more. Guys, this is the thing. This is literally the thing. There's nothing else. If, if, if We are never too busy to get this right. The author of Hebrews says, you should never be too busy to get this right. Your schedule should never be too full to get this right. Your schedule should, you, like, your life should never be too overwhelmed to get this right. You are, you are, it, this is way too important for you to miss. It's way too important for you to busy yourself out of it. It's way too important for you to be too good. No, I'm fine. I don't need a group to get this right. It's way too important for you to give this advice to other people and never receive it yourself. It's way too important for this to be the thing that our church is built on and it not be a value in your life. You were never meant to walk through faith alone. You were meant to do it together. Do you have people like this in your life? Because if you don't, you will never experience all that God has for you. And ultimately, that's what we want for you as a church. That's why we've built this thing on small groups. Now, this, this isn't a, like... If you don't do this, you got to sign up to small groups today. It's not the pitch. As a matter of fact, I'm not offering you to sign up for a small group today. That happens in months. What I am asking you to do is that if you sit here and you can answer this question and you say, no, Jim, that, that, that's, that's me. I don't have them. Here's what I want you to do. It's really simple. You ready? Find them. Find them. Look around you. Who are you serving with? Who are you meeting? Who greets you at the door? Find some people to work through your faith together. And, and if there's, there's people that here that, 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 aren't, that you're not connecting with, go find a group of friends somewhere else. They don't have to just be at a church here. Who do you surround your faith with? Who are the friends that surround your faith? One of my closest, doesn't, he doesn't live within an hour and a half of here. Yet we work through our faith every single week together. Who are your friends? I know you have some. If you don't, come talk to me. I'd love to be your friend. <laughs> Who are your friends? If you need some, let us know. We'll do our best to help you find them and to help you plug in. And for those of you who've kind of worked through this, and you are one of those people who has surrounded your faith with friends, and you've grown, and you've experienced depths, Maybe you need to become them. Maybe you need to bring people in to experience your faith so you can be the encouragement, so you can lead and you can show and you can encourage and you can spur. For, for those of you who are in small groups, and, and, and maybe you know, the, the answer to this isn't always small groups because as you know, if you're in a group, you can, you can be in a group and you can go to a group and you can never do this for each other. You can be completely platonic and not share and never open up, and never really be the, the friends. This isn't really just a small group answer. This is a you answer. But for those of you who are in groups, and maybe you're not experiencing that, I, I created a tool that I'm asking all of our small group leaders. It's going to be emailed to you this week. Just to assess where you're at on the four things we talked about. Are we pursuing God? Are we holding on to hope? Are we, are we changing the world? Are we overcoming sin? Can we do better? Can we experience a deeper level of community and a deeper level of a relationship with God with each other? I'm calling it a, a better we. Because I, I think in small groups, that's what we should be doing. Becoming better. Better at walking through life. Better at carrying each other's burdens. Better at encouraging and in praying for each other. Better at lifting each other up. You may be wondering after this 
th this service. Jim, where'd you get all those stories? <clears throat> Truth is, they all came from my small group. All those stories are about people who sit in my small group that for the last year and a half, we've walked through life together. We sat around, I can't count how many fire pits and talked about our challenges and prayed for each other and encouraged each other. And, and I can't tell you the amount of time we prayed for people that were down and broken and, and ready to give up on their faith. And, and the people that felt like there was no other answer and they would come just defeated and watching God help them and pick them up. For people that felt like there was just a struggle in their life and you continue to pray and pray and pray. And then you begin to see them get it and overcome. Like that's, that's where the emotion is. That's where the life is. That's where the deep is. The deep is calling you. You see, the, the truth is we're just a group of, of normal people. Here's, here's a, a picture. We had a Friendsgiving last night. We, were <clears throat> we had a Friendsgiving last night, and we're missing a few people there, so if you weren't at the last night's event, sorry, you missed out. <clears throat> just a, a normal group of people. I'm commonly attractive. <laughs> Very friendly. But Normal. And I have watched some of the most incredible growth happen over the last year and a half. I've grown. My wife has grown over the last year and a half in ways we never thought possible. Here's the thing. That's exactly what God wants for you. Deep is calling. Will you answer? Would you be willing to maybe inconvenience yourself a little bit? I know your personalities. I know the, I know the concerns. I'm with you. After Sunday, I go home and I sleep for hours because talking in front of people just drains me. I get it. It's worth it. I know the tradition. Don't talk about faith. It, it, it's yours. It's uncomfortable. Break it. It's worth it. Would you be willing to put some friends around your faith and grow and experience a level of depth you never thought possible before? Deep is calling. Guys, I think it's time for us to answer it. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, <clears throat> God, for this simple passage of Scripture that has, God, just so much truth. And, and, and even though it was written thousands of years ago, it, it just amazes me every time I open and read it, God, how applicable it is to my life right now. God, I pray for every person here who's maybe going through life, God, on their own, who's going through faith on their own. Lord, that today would be the thing that, that, that spurs them on, that encourages them, that lights a fire under them, to surround their faith with some friends, God, to not do this thing alone anymore, but to realize it, is, it would be so much better and so much more effective if I were doing it with other people. I pray that you would help them, God, see the need in their life for friends, to, for faith friends, God, and then the wisdom to go out and surround themselves with it. For those of us who are in groups, God, I pray that we would continue to encourage, to lift each other up, to spur each other on for good things, to overcome sin, and to change the world. God, that is the message you left us with, and that is the message I want to see us take into the world and change. I thank you for the opportunity this morning to share this, Lord, and I pray, God, at least for one person here, for that, it to sink into their heart and make a change. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.